Inverse trigonometric functions are very important in calculus. We've already talked about the derivatives of our trigonometric functions, sine, cosine, tangent, cosecant, secant, and cotangent. Again, those are ones you need to commit to memory. You're also going to have to know the derivatives of inverse trigonometric functions, such as inverse sine or inverse cosine. So how do we come up with those? To start off, let's think of x equals sine y. If I have x equals sine y, the domain of my function sine is negative infinity to infinity, and the range is negative 1 to 1, with those endpoints included. When I talk about the inverse function, that is y is equal to sine inverse of x, in that case the domain is equal to the range of its original function, negative 1 to 1. The range, however, we limit to negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, because otherwise sine is not 1 to 1. By limiting it to that range, then our result is in fact 1 to 1. In order to take an inverse, you need to have a 1 to 1 function. So let's see if we can go from this to come up with our derivative. We're going to take the derivative of both sides, and the derivative of x is simply 1, and the derivative of sine y is cosine y times y prime. Again, we need to do the chain rule because y is a function of x. Now I'm going to go ahead and solve for y prime, and I get that y prime is equal to 1 over cosine y. The trouble is I don't want this in terms of y, I want this in terms of x. So what I'm going to have to use is one of my trigonometric identities. Sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta is 1. Solving for cosine theta, I get that equals plus or minus the square root of 1 minus sine squared theta, which doesn't yet help me particularly, even if I rewrite this as cosine y, which is what I'm looking for, because I still don't want this in terms of y. Well, if I go up to the top, I remember that x is actually equal to sine y, so I can rewrite this as such. Now we're getting somewhere. I still don't like this plus or minus, but if I know that the range of my inverse sine is between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2, that corresponds to the first and fourth quadrants. Using the mnemonic, all students take calculus, I realize that in quadrants 1 and 4, cosine is positive. Therefore, if I've limited my range to negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, I can safely say that this is going to be positive square root of 1 minus x squared. So if I go ahead and rewrite this, y prime is equal to 1 over cosine y, or 1 over 1 minus x squared. And that is the derivative of inverse sine. Again, this is one that you're going to have to commit to memory. Let's do a couple of examples. All right, for my first example, I'm going to have to use not only the rule that I just came up with, but the chain rule as well. So the derivative of this is going to be equal to 1 over the square root of 1 minus whatever is in that input to my inverse sine, which in this case is x squared minus 1, and all of that will be squared. Then I have to do the chain rule, that is to take the derivative of whatever is inside my sine inverse, and that's going to just be 2x. I could simplify this a little bit more, but as I've said before, I'm not really interested in you simplifying because you can easily make a mistake in the simplification when you are able to do the actual derivative. So we'll go ahead and leave it in this form. Let's take the second example. In this case, my outside function is cosine. So when I take the derivative of cosine, that's equal to negative sine. And again, I'm going to do whatever's inside that cosine as its input. But now I need to do the chain rule, that is, take the derivative of the inside of the cosine, which in this case is 1 minus the square root of 1 minus x squared. Now in this case, there is one simplification I am going to expect you to do. If I take sine of inverse sine of something, well, that gives me back whatever I started with. So that is just equal to x. So sine of inverse sine of anything is just equal to that anything, because the sine and the inverse sine undo each other. So whereas I'm not expecting you to multiply out binomials to simplify, I am expecting you to be able to recognize that sine of inverse sine is in fact equal to its original input. All right, so I've gone ahead and filled in my first inverse trig function that I've calculated. The next one I'm going to attack is my inverse tangent. Before I do that, however, I want to show you the graph of sine inverse and its derivative. So in purple, I have sine inverse of x. Domain of that function is negative 1 to 1, and its range goes from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. The derivative of inverse sine was 1 over square root of 1 minus x squared. 
And if you look at this graph, I think you can see that this does in fact match. That is, any point here, let's pick this point right there, it certainly looks like the slope of that is positive. It looks like anywhere along this line, I have a positive tangent. And my derivative graph, you notice that's all above the x-axis, that means it's all positive. The lowest number it is, is right at zero, where the slope is exactly equal to one. So the graph of the derivative does in fact look like it explains the rate of change of my inverse sine function. So now let's talk about inverse tangent. Just to remind us what inverse tangent looks like, I've done a graph of tangent x and then inverse tangent x. This looks very different than the inverse sine, which was limited in terms of its domain. The domain of tangent, anything other than pi over 2 plus k pi, where k is an integer. And the range is negative infinity to positive infinity. So the inverse tangent, its domain is the range of my tangent function, or negative infinity to positive infinity. Its range is negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. And we're going to work on the derivative like we did for our sine. We're going to first set up y equals tangent of x that it's equivalent to y equals tan inverse of x. I want to take the derivative of both sides, and when I do that, I get 1 equals, the derivative of tangent is secant squared, and of course I have to use the chain rule because y is a function of x, so that's times y prime. I'll go ahead and solve for y prime, and I get that y prime is 1 over secant squared y. Again, I'm going to have to resort to a trig identity, and my trig identity is secant squared y equals 1 plus tangent squared y. In this case, I have secant squared, so it's not like when I was doing the sine and I had to take the square root. I can just go ahead and plug this into my equation. And why is 1 plus tangent squared y better than secant squared y? Well, that's because I know that x is equal to tan y. So that means y prime is simply equal to 1 over 1 plus x squared. And that is my derivative of inverse tangent. If I look at the graph of that, if I zoom in on that, the green line is my derivative, 1 over 1 plus x squared. Tan inverse of x is in red. I see again that no matter where I look at the tangent line, it looks like the tangent line is always above 0, which is what my graph in green shows. And there is one place where, again, it looks like the derivative is equal to 1, and that's right at 0. As x approaches negative infinity, that slope gets smaller and smaller, approaches 0, just like it does in my graph. And the same thing happens to positive infinity. That curve gets flatter and flatter, which has a slope closer and closer to 0, which is what's happening here. And now I'm going to fill in the rest of the table. I went ahead and wrote in what we found for inverse tangent. Inverse cotangent is going to look very similar. It's simply going to be negative 1 over 1 plus x squared. My cosine and sine are very similar, except again, just like the difference between tangent and cotangent, it will be a negative 1 in my numerator. And just like sine, the cosine is going to be limited to negative 1 to 1. I'm not going to go ahead and prove the inverse secant and the inverse cosecant. I'm just going to give them to you. The inverse secant is 1 over the absolute value of x times the square root of x squared minus 1, and the cosecant is that same thing with a negative sign. Both of those, I'm going to have to specify that the absolute value of x is in fact greater than 1. Let's go ahead and take two examples. I'm going to have to use the product rule in order to find f prime of x. The derivative of x with respect to x is 1, so I'll just have tan inverse x minus 2 plus x times the derivative of tan inverse of x divided by 2. Well, the derivative of tan inverse, that's simply 1 plus whatever I'm taking the inverse tangent of squared. And again, I'm not going to be able to forget the chain rule because I'm not just taking the inverse tangent of x, it's x divided by 2. The derivative of x divided by 2 is 1 half. So this simplifies to this, but if I want to get rid of complex fractions, I'm going to have to multiply the numerator and denominator by 4 and end up with this as my final answer. If I'm trying to find g prime of x, the derivative of inverse secant x is 1 over the absolute value of whatever I'm taking the inverse secant of, which in this case is 2x, times the square root of 2x all squared, minus 1. And then I'm going to need to remember the chain rule because the derivative of 2x is 2. So this simplifies to 1 over 
the absolute value of x times 4x squared minus 1. So these are the derivatives you need to commit to memory. The derivatives of the trigonometric functions as well as the derivatives of the inverse trigonometric functions.